What's going on? Welcome to another edition of the Build Series. I'm your host, Kevin Kenny, and uh, nice enough to stop by after a gig last night here in New York. Metric, everybody. Hi. Not to go over tire material, because we were just talking all about the gig before we went live, but it was, it was a fun time at King's Theater last night. Oh, it's such a great venue. Yeah, uh, in Brooklyn. We had an amazing night. It's like beautiful, ornate. They've put so much work into it. It's a great place to see a show. Now, Jimmy, you were saying that uh, you didn't really have a preference, whether it's a club or a theater or whatever the environment is, but how do those shows differ? Well, I think there's just kind of a, you know, in a club show, it's like usually a little sweatier. People kind of get a little more raucous. There's usually a little drinkier. And, yeah. um, but in the theater ones, there's kind of like this sort of respect for the room. It's more introspective. It's a little more pensive. People are kind of listening more. Um, you know, and then on the other end of the, fe on the, the spectrum, there's like the festival shows where there's like tens of thousands of people and it's like they're listening to music all day and it's just, there's so many different vibes to perform in, you know, it's just kind of, uh, it was one of a good one though. Yeah, I mean, you guys have like crazy stories, awesome stories uh, from here in New York City. You did one of Lou Reed's last performances ever at Radio City, is that right? Yeah. What was that night like? I mean, it was just one of those ones where you're like, okay, I guess I'm kind of done in a way, in all seriousness, you know, like the significance for me, I'm sure for a, most New Yorkers, but in the world, but of the Velvet Underground and Lou Reed was also really personal. My brother and my dad, who kind of educated me in music, um, you know, were really early on and making me steer toward like being a writer and being an artist as opposed to being drawn into like, you know, I think Tiffany was on the radio or something when I was a kid and they were like, you could be a writer, you know, you don't have to be that way. Right. Um, and then the fact that my life brought me to meet Lou and that he connected with the band so much and when we played at Radio City, he um, performed the song with us that he actually wrote. He wrote a song with us called Wanderlust on our album Synthetica. Um, and then we, we put it together with the song Pale Blue Eyes, which is like kind of famously he would never play anymore. And then um, his management started calling me the Lou Whisperer because they were like, he played it with you. And we had this beautiful night and we had no idea that it would be, you know, one of his last nights. And such a, again, like really respecting the rooms, these legendary theaters, like, you know, it's the kind of thing you take for granted. I think in a city like New York, you have such amazing architecture, but for us, you know, we travel the world. There's a lot of like arenas and places named after corporations and these really beautiful theaters with all the history that are really about the art to have that and share it with Lou is a serious honor. It's oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, can we not make it be the Quiznos Radio City <laughs> Musical? Yeah, exactly. At some point, that would be awesome. Please. <laughs> if you had to guess, though, or if you had to theorize, why did why do you think Lou made that exception performing um, the song? Well, I think I mean, he had a... Uh, he had a soft spot for you. He that's did, and he... Well, I mean, that's the thing, is, like, the work that I did with him and, you know, Laurie Anderson is someone I really admire as well, and I performed with them at a festival in Australia. Um, I think it was, you know, it was one of those things of, like, you know, where you feel like someone sees you for the person that you are as a writer and he really liked my solo work and um you know I'm very happy to report in an era when I think there's a lot of stuff coming out about people that like is like nothing but very much of an amazing mentor and really respectful of me as a writer you know because you could be like oh it's that chick from metric like that synth player or something and instead it felt like he recognized the writing and um and that I was not like full of it and a lot of people are and yeah. a lot of people succeed because they're full of it. And it was a really cool moment for me and for the band to be recognized by him for not being full of it. Yeah. I mean, Emily talks about that being a moment for her that, you know, you can be done now, right? Like yeah. mission accomplished. Jimmy, have you had a moment like that personally? Well, I mean, it was probably the same moment. Was it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Like we, were, we were on stage and, um, you know, I kind of started the, the guitar riff to Pale Blue Eyes and I, I like look out at the room and I look over at Lou and I'm looking over at the, the band and the, there was actually a band uh, with us on tour called Half Moon Run who are these amazing singers. All three of them can just sing harmonies beautifully. So they were on one side of the stage and they were all singing harmonies and it was just sort of like, yeah, it was one of those moments you look out and go, I not only never thought this would happen, but I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do after this. Yeah. Do you feel, almost feel weightless in a moment like that just because of how surreal it's Lou, it's yeah. you guys, it's like yeah. Radio City, which you've seen on television for years. Very like, much. I, there's there's somewhere, there's like there's video footage of us going into the band room after the show, and I saw it years later, and it's like I don't even really recognize the four of us. We're like not 
on Earth. You're somewhere else. Yeah, it was cool. Uh, speaking of shows, you guys uh, did the Pumpkin Store last year, right? How did that come about? Like, did, does Corgan call you up? Does like, is that just something that's done like behind the you scenes? You know, I mean, this is it's actually a really great question because I think people don't realize um, how outside the industry metric is, uh, and we've really somehow <laughs> managed to like hang on like a barnacle on the side um, and have a really amazing life and career, and perhaps a better one as a result of our independent spirit. Um, but you know, a lot of times you see bands and artists, they're on a certain label and the whole thing is like, I'll give you this, give me this and I'll give you that. But we, we're not affiliated. So we don't get any of those benefits a lot of times. And in this case, it was like a tour that was presented. A lot of people wanted it. And as we were told, it was like Corrigan listened to the new album, Art of Doubt, before it had come out. And I think initially it was like we were going to get half the tour and then he heard the record and he was like he wanted us on the, on the whole thing. So it's, you know, kind of a theme of like what we're talking about is because of the way we're set up, we get there's actual merit. Yeah. And we kind of know when we get something, we know there's only one way we could have gotten it because nobody's really yeah, like rooting for us. Real. Yeah. We, yeah. We own no bartering chips. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> so it's just like. Um, it's the same thing, you know, with like having, you know, having played great slots at Coachella and all those those sort of yeah. markers for artists. We, you know, even in the hard times, I think that's what we always come back to is like, you know, that we can we can rest assured that anything we've earned, we actually earned. Yeah. You got to uh, on the tour with Corgan and the Pumpkins, you opened for them and you got to play a lot of shows that probably were largely maybe not metric fans. There, of course, were fans there, but it was largely probably a Pumpkins crowd. And you got to test out this new record, which I think is pretty cool. I was curious, do you have like a person or people in your lives that are that tough crowd that may not be the biggest fans of your music that you bring music to in your personal circles? And you'll yeah, say, hey, I mean, you know, like, let mean, me test we this do. out. There's, there's a... <laughs> There's a few listens that sort of like uh, traditionally happen at the end of, of a record. They usually happen in the studio. They usually happen you later. You bring now. someone in, you're like, okay, yeah. today's the day I'm going to play it for. Yeah, and there, but there's there's a few people in our lives that are like, are, are sort of normal go-tos. And just, you need to gauge their reaction and you kind of, you also need to know to take their reaction not too seriously because they're not always going to react the same way and they're not always going to react the way you think they're going to. And sometimes... You know, you feel really strongly about something, and your best friend is like, "I don't get it," and it doesn't mean you should go back and rewrite it. It just means you should have a different best friend. Yeah, well, like, yeah, or Justin Broadbent, who did this artwork and has done so much artwork with us over the years. He won a Juno for his um, synthetic artwork. He worked with me on all the Choir of the Mind stuff. Um, when we came, he came in to play uh, hear the record. We were planning always on opening with Dress to Suppress. And he was like, oh, cool, you're doing this like super kind of ambient epic thing. And we were like, Are, that's not, that isn't the, the first thing we want people to get from this record. We want them to get the like, you know, sort of rebellious, resilient spirit and the sense that there's massive guitars and the guitars are back. And yeah. that definitely influenced our decision to put Dark Saturday first. Even though he wasn't saying anything negative, it was just right. kind of like, it was a big noted that yeah. flashed above the mixing board. This is the first record that you did not uh, produce or co-produce. Is that right, Jim? Yeah, it is. Now, what did this experience teach you about you as a producer? It taught me how to play guitar because I wasn't you... worried about what everybody else was doing. Like the, one, one of the things that I really didn't want to do going into this record was, and I started noticing that I've been doing for records after records, was putting more energy in the sound of the snare drum, the performance of the drums, uh, the, the production of the rhythm section, the something or something other than the guitar work. And uh, you know, one of the guys that mixed uh, most of our records, uh, he would say that the first thing he would do when we showed up to mix a record is set up a guitar amp because I wouldn't have played any of the guitars yet. And we would get into the mix and we'd be like, how does this mix sound? And he'd be like, well, it sounds all right, but you haven't played guitar yet because you just always leave out the guitar work until the very end. Right. And I think on this one was like, let's let's not do that. Let let me join the band, um, be on the other side of the glass, and remember how to play the instrument. You know, the way that we kind of wanted me to when we started this band. And yeah. uh, so it was kind of picking up after like not focusing on it for a lot a lot of years. You talk about when you started the band, there is sort of a theme of like returning to your roots, returning to your origins. Was there something in your personal lives that uh, led to that desire to sort of return to square one? I don't know. Really good question. It's true. It's weird. It's kind of like that sense of like you got to go away to come back. Um, I think, you know, fans who've been with us from the beginning will recognize we've always been experimental. We've never been like perfectly one thing because we're always pushing ourselves. And um, I think we got to go far enough with Pagans, like into electronic, that it just felt like 
we could actually see the band from that perspective finally and be like, oh, there, there we are. And, you know, hugely, and we've talked about this a lot on this record, but like Justin producing it, um, he really, really brought the band back together. It was a very, like, we weren't apart, but we just had developed ways of working that weren't about the four of us in a room. And, you know, typical metric style, this is like the most unpopular, uns like it's not at all the time to be a band. And it's philosophically such a different ethos than like, it's all about me and like my personal, you know, like cult of personality. It's couldn't be more opposite. It's like, it's about friendship. It's about compromise and democracy, literally. Yeah. And he really emphasized that. And, but I, it's a good question. I don't know. Well, we didn't, I, we know didn't really, yeah, like we didn't really go in thinking like, this is exactly what's going to happen. We knew that I wanted, I knew I wanted to be free of that role, but I think it wasn't until he started kind of flooding us with confidence and, and making us play together that we realized how much fun it was to just play together again yeah. and, uh, and how effective that was. And then we just kind of ran with it once that was happening. Justin was a, a bass player for Beck? Yeah. Yeah, he was right. a bass player in Beck, and but like also Air, Nine director, Inch Nails. Like, yeah. He's, done, he's yeah. done a ton of stuff. Yeah, M83. Was there was there was there an era of his career that actually attracted you the most? You talked. I think it was the M83 stuff. Yeah. Um, the the latter stuff. It was that that M8 those those two, uh, M83 records were huge for me and I think for you yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was the way that he kind of did electronics that I was really attracted to. It wasn't. It wasn't really even the bass playing. It was. It. I mean, I always knew he was a bass player and I knew kind of what his pedigree was, but it wasn't until we got into the studio and we were just kind of like. Just getting settled in the morning, put a cup of coffee down. He would like pick up a bass and be like, <laughs> and be like, okay, don't do that again. Yeah. Well, and Josh ended up, I mean, Josh did his best work as a bass player on this record, I think, played every single note and I think wrote his best writing. But he got early on, mm -hmm. I think he got like, if not the first, one of the very uh, few first like Fender limited edition um, JMJ signature bases. JMJ basses. So that was awesome. How did you not producing this record affect you as an artist, Emily? It was great. I had my friend back because, you know, when Jimmy's describing that process, it applies to me too as the lyricist, you know, and I'm the one who kind of generally brings in like the first fragments of songs and they're pretty delicate, sensitive, you know, and Jimmy was always kind of tasked with helping me translate that and be like, you know, how can you make that more understandable to someone or I don't get what you mean and I know you really well. So maybe you have to clarify that lyric and that kind of editing and, input he was just always having to be looking over and in this case it was just you know every so much of what I did was in the room with everyone like I'd bring it was the usual process of like bringing stuff to to Jimmy to like you know flesh it out but then it was ultimately up to Justin to be like that's cool you can run with that and without Jimmy having hanging over his head the feeling that he's gonna either like over edit me to the point that I've it's like conformist or taken my voice away or let something roll that's just like too weird, which anyone who's heard my solo work knows that if I could, I would just, I'd, you know, I like it. I like some weirder stuff. Yeah. So, but I love my role in metric. It's not that, like it's a different sort of voice and there needs to be continuity with that. And Justin, I think being a fan was able to just like see all the records, see the four of us and be like, guys, you're metric, like be that. Yeah. I mean, now we've had some time to sit with this record. I think it came out maybe four or five months ago. Looking back now and, and kind of having an appreciation of, of what it's become, do you think this is the new path for you in terms of production? Do you think you, you jump back in the saddle or you think it's mm -hmm. better off? I don't think I would jump back in the saddle with Metric. But you should produce other now. bands. I would love like... to do other bands, but I wouldn't do it with this band, at least not, not now. Because it just no. went so well. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I had a way better time. Yeah. I slept, you know? Which was nice. It's always a welcome addition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Emily, I think you were talking about this record, but you may have just been talking about uh, where you are at as an artist in general, about this uh, this not having the luxury of eventually. Do you remember saying something along those lines? I do. We had, I don't know if this is the same thing or not, but we had, we had Moby on the show last week, and he was talking about just sort of like the loss of potential as you age, not only as a person, but as an artist, and how that impacts your art. Was that sort of the same sentiment you were getting at with that statement? I mean, it applies to a lot of things, and I think unlike a lot of people, I don't have, like, a big beef or, like, stigma around not being 20. Um, everyone who's 20, I'm like, peace, see you when you're, if you're lucky, yeah. not 20. I mean, the idea that we have this attitude toward the good fortune of being able to, like, live a life and have that be something that, it like, drags us down is such a backwards way of looking 
at life. And I find it like super, actually find it rude to yourself and the luxury and, you know, good fortune and privilege we have to live where we do and all the million reasons that we aren't dead. Um, you know, I really feel like as a musician, as an artist, as a human being, I've gotten stronger, better writer, better singer, better athlete, <laughs> better friend. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't really feel like um, dragged backwards by those things. Yeah. Well, and then think about all the people that were around when you guys were 20 that aren't around anymore in terms of just you guys are still doing it. And I think there's, a, there's something to say about that. Well, and I think the difference is, and we really felt it last night, was like we're not, it's not kind of like we had it and now we're just kind of trying to simulate it. It's like we, everything, the meaning of this band has always been um, really principled and ethical. And like we do things according to principles that mean something to us. And it may mean that we don't always stand at the top or at the front of the pack, but the people who come to our shows, like they know us and there's such a beautiful connection. And uh, I feel like the show we did last night is like, it's it's better than our last show. Everything yeah. is constantly going forward. Yeah. So yeah, there is no eventually because like, you know, it's now. Yeah, I read in some press release, check your nostalgia, I think you said. And I think that's a, kind of sums up. Well, that's tricky too, because you don't want to be, exactly, you don't want to be always like, okay, so what was it? Your perfect moment, the perfect you that you're trying to retain, you know, like you're going to get plastic surgery to look like what? When you were yeah. 32, 24, like what? When is it? Yeah. You know, to me, once you subscribe to that way of thinking, you, that is the narrative of your life. Yeah. And you're basically ensuring a sense of decline forever. Yeah. If you have a different view, which is to, you know, my mother, she's in her 80s. And whenever I call her, I'm like, how are you doing, mom? She's like, unbelievable, like incredible. And she always says to me, you have to trust me. Everyone tells you that life gets worse and worse. And she's like, only now are things, fragments of my life. You know, she lived in New York, you know, had my brother here, or a huge epic history in the city with my family. And, you know, she's like, only now are threads of what I was doing then making sense to me. And we're all told to fear that time. But she's like, it's crazy, don't listen. Yeah, she's like, this is the best. Yeah, if you take care of yourself, to to that's it, it. Like. you take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, Dude, I got to ask you guys, I was watching, there's a great thing that CBC does. It's like jam or no jam, and they had you guys listen to songs oh, yeah. or whatever. And then I am, I might be the only one, but I'm a massive Len fan. Oh, yeah. And you guys yeah. are friends with Len, or like you well, were buddies with, well, with Len? Well, with Brendan. So Bren, Brendan was like, well, see, Burger Pimp? Well, no, this is you what's weird is I didn't, I, this is hilarious. We're going to figure this out right now because okay. I, I did know Mark, but only because when I was making my first solo thing cut you were in half. It in that house. Yeah, with that guy Malcolm and that by the park. It was Mark's house. It was Mark's house, yeah. but I didn't ever make the connection. Like I think I he, I passed him once in the hallway. Like I don't think we ever. I don't think I'm. I don't. I don't think I ever met him. Yeah. He tried to buy a piece of gear off me like a year ago. Did you shut him like, down? No, we. You we, got he like, Len? Yeah, he like wrote me and he was like, "Oh yeah, I saw that you're selling that EQ and whatever." And I'm Mark from Len, and I was like, "Oh cool, we never met." It's like deep acquaintanceship. Maybe. Like you have to understand the Toronto music scene is such a, it really is like what it looks like is yeah. true. It's a big hug yeah. and there's such camaraderie. And like, I think I was just always like, oh, cool, Mark. And yeah. he never needed to follow up and neither did but I. Bre but like Brendan Canning from Social Scene, mm -hmm. bass player, um, well, everything player, uh, he, he wrote part of Steal My Sunshine. Right. So he, I don't know if he was like fully but in what, the band that or not. head? Maybe no, he was in. To he was in Wikipedia head. page. He was in. Head. Brendan was. But that's in head. unrelated. Unrelated. Okay. Well, unless it's just Brendan who was related to Brendan in both bands. <laughs> you know. Which one was Burger Pimp? I think one that's guy Len. went by Burger Pimp. Oh, I don't know yeah, the guy in Len. Uh, yeah, yeah, like the lead singer of Len. That's the most '90s thing I've yeah. ever heard oh, in my the whole best. life. Yeah. It's actually our desktop background at the radio that's station. Really? It's just like well, him with his Chiron. By that park, and you know the one I'm talking about, the diagonal. I'll um I'll let him know. Yeah, their debut album is like one of the strangest things I've ever heard. I like just we'll talk about it after. I'll go have to go check that out now. It's like really bizarre. I can't believe it got made. Uh, let's go to Twitter really quick before we get to uh, the studio audience questions. The first tweet uh, asks, "What is your favorite song off Art of Doubt to perform live?" Ah. Uh. I mean, for me right now, it's probably uh, No Lights on the Horizon, but only because we just started playing it. So it's like four shows in, where all the other ones are like seventy. You know? For me, it's Risk. Actually, it's probably Risk. It's awesome. <laughs> it's the, the best one we've ever done. Does your favorite song to play, kind of tying it back to the first thing we talked about, does the favorite song to play, does that differ depending on the venue? Or no, not at all? I mean, sure. No, not really. 
No, it's really. really, I mean, it's like, as I was talking before the show, I was warning you, I'm really bad at any sort of, like, absolutes. Like, if yeah, I yeah, say yeah. favorite something, I'm not very good at that. And yeah. You know, it's one like, of the things that we, I kind of realized last night, too, is like, this: that we're in soundcheck, we get into this venue, and it's beautiful, and you see the whole ceiling. By the time the show hits, like, you can't see anything. Oh, I know. It doesn't matter. Like, all I can see is these guys and yeah. my pedals, and that's, like, it's all just... You can hear them. Smoke and you know they're there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it's it's fine. It's all the same stuff. It's just like whether the stage is comfortable or not. That's yeah. basically it. Yeah, that's the best though. When fans will be like, "I'm Marty. I was at the Des Moines show. You remember?" <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get to. Uh, maybe there's a Marty here. Let's get to some studio audience questions. The first one will come from right over here. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask because you guys are such a versatile band. Um, do you guys take inspiration from other versatile bands? Uh. I mean, I listen to a lot of stuff, um, and I think, yeah, weirdly in general, I don't really listen to stuff that sounds like metric. Like, I kind of draw on um, kind of anything. I think, in, in fact, like, there's a bit of a principle behind, I think, what makes an impact on me, which is, it applies to, like, everything, is that it's not so much what people make, it's, like, why, you know? And there can be someone doing something that looks and sounds exactly like metric, and they, they, their reasons and their motives are, like, couldn't be further from who we are. And meanwhile, there could be something that's like, you know, one guy making electronic music, like a John Hopkins record or something. And like, I feel completely connected with that. And um, that's true of, of all things. So I listen to a lot of like electronic stuff. I'm into this band Ceviche. They make like really cool electronic stuff. So I mean, there's, and it's kind of the same with all four of us, I think. Like when, when the four of us end up like hanging out on the bus late night and playing music and kind of DJing for each other. There's nothing in there that's in the same genre as, as us, really. It's it's gonna it's be like, like most deaf and slim Whitman. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> most deaf and slim Whitman. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Is there that. any fear of, uh, of emulation if you listen to bands that are similar to you? Is there what fear? Like of a fear of emulation? Like oh, like if you're listening to something that is is no? Uh, Not really. I mean, if you, I'd love to get inspired. You yeah. Know, but um, I don't. I think at this point, also like we really have become ourselves, and I think it would take even if we tried. I mean, early days, if there was something that influenced me and I'd be like, you know, super honest about like, does it seem like I'm being derivative or something? Nobody would even know the reference I was making. Sometimes if you're really yourself, it's like hard to not yeah, like be. I, I was probably listening to like mainstream radio the most in my entire life during the making of Pagans. And there's like, that's like the weirdest record we've ever made. <laughs> so no, not really. Yeah, no rhyme or reason. Uh, let's get to the final studio audience question. Hi. Um, I actually have a question from our site. Um, over the years, how does your band maintain authenticity and transparency with your fans in a world where a lot of bands can come off as inauthentic over social media? I mean, it's a really good question. And like we we probably like I don't want to make us sound like we're a billion years old, but probably like half our career was like before social media was important. Um, and I'm proud of that. Yep, yeah, me too. And uh, and so it was a very weird transition to be like, okay, we have to take this medium seriously when, frankly, none of us really wanted to, and um, and be be authentic in it instead of like we can't just post a bunch of stuff. And and in the beginning, people were like, just post whatever. Let's post like what you had for breakfast. And, and we we're like, refuse oh, I'm to not. Do it. I can't do that. Like I can't. I can't even photograph like. A food item, like in, in I'm not posting an omelet on metrics, no, like so. It's just <laughs> it's not so. Happening. It's cool that people do that, and for them, that does seem genuine. For us, we just had to sort of find what actually just felt correct and not stupid for us, you know. And, yeah, and I actually felt also like a real pressure that suddenly the stakes had moved. Like I feel like I'm so honest and like unvarnished within the work and within the way that we perform that it was this like extra ask like yeah. now I got to wake up in the morning like uh, like at my house and think all day about like what metrics supposed to post like I actually found it really stressful and it was a tricky time and then I and then happily we did kind of find that spot where we're like consistent with everything else of who we are it's just there's nothing up there that's not who we are and if people are going to lose interest in the band because you don't know what omelet um, I'm okay with that. And also like this sort of abstract, like success that you're supposed to attain with that extra, however many followers because you posted that or like, you know, the accidental like self beat, like, I don't know. We're willing to lose at that gamble. But for the record, it's a Denver omelet for the record, <laughs> for the record. 
I was like, isn't it a bit obnoxious though how intertwined those things are? Like, you guys did not grow up like wanting to like take awesome pictures or like make engaging captions. Like, you grew up wanting to be in band, and no, you're doing it was, that. It was the opposite. Like, like the, for us historically, bands were cool because you had no you idea well, what that was, was happening. It. The end of Mystique, yeah, was a real yeah, well put. Bummer. Yeah, it was kind of like, but wait, I felt like I was crafting the exact opposite. And then on the on the good side, I feel like. Now I've kind of settled into a thing of like, all right, well, but also just me like, you know, futzing around, I guess is pretty good too. Yeah. If that's what you're into. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I just, to, I'm with you. Like I always wanted to be, you know, like, like we, as we're talking about Lou Reed or someone that you, you know, like when I got my first email from Lou, I was like, oh no, like how can Lou have an email? Yeah. Yeah. That's terrible. But it's like, no, it's not. Guys got to like, you know. Yeah. I'm fully A freaked Lou out. Lou Reed at AOL, like, you know. By like, <laughs> Mick Jagger's Instagram is the weirdest thing in the world. I was just thinking about like, that. I can't look at that. Yeah. It's like, what are you it's doing? Like Paul McCartney, like, like Dan. Mick I Jagger saw. has a phone? Ew. <laughs> I thought you lived in space. And on that note, we have more with Metric coming up. They're actually going to be nice enough to perform if you're joining us on buildseries.com. And if you're not, we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching, everybody.